Hello and welcome to The Rabid Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Like and share the video. Join the Rabid Nation, a nation of people dedicated to normalizing atheism and deconversion by hitting the subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel in a more tangible way, hit the join button and your membership options that lead to citizenship in the Rabid Nation will be presented to you. Today I'm continuing on in my Bible studies series, Tongues of Fire, where I'm examining Pentecostal theology based on the book of Acts. And today I've reached Acts 4, 23 through the end of the chapter in verse 37, where there are two major divisions. You can stop the video, go read the passage and return, or you can continue on. I'm going to give you a basic synopsis. But the main issue is twofold. How do believers of the early church respond to the threat of the Sanhedrin? And what was the nature of the primitive church in the early part of the book of Acts? Now, bottom line, what they do in response to the threat to uh, Peter and John is they go pray about it. And the end result is that God honors their prayers, shakes the place where they're li they are at, and then they're filled with more power and have even more boldness to preach the gospel. Now, at this point, Pentecostals use this part of passage to justify how it's really necessary for the church to pray just about everything. And to be fair uh, to modern Pentecostals, there's so many Pentecostals, very devout Pentecostals, that literally will pray about everything. You will never meet a people of faith that is so ready to pray as a devout group of Pentecostals. I knew many who carried around bottles of oil to anoint people to pray for healing at the drop of a hat. Um, you would talk about a situation you were facing, and immediately three of them say, well, let's pray about it. Um, one of the things that I can say about Pentecostals uh, is their devotion to the idea of prayer changing things. And so a lot of theology of prayer comes from this. I mean, look at the result. You know, they prayed about their, their struggles. God shakes the place where they're living. And the response is, hey, no, I'm going to give you more of the Holy Spirit, and you're going to preach the word of God with boldness. And so there's ingrained in this Pentecostal theology this idea of prayer, being able to change a person's situation. And so they pray about just about bloody everything, from traffic lights to whatever, you know, to the most mundane of things. And it's because of this passage where prayer seems to be part of the early church in every, every aspect. But the second part of the thing is where we're going to talk about most today, because given what this passage says about the early church, how in the world do Pentecostals fall prey to, the Pente to this prosperity gospel, this idea of planting seeds and whatever of money into a person's ministry, and thus they receive even more. But most early Pentecostals that I've talked about who also believe in the prosperity gospel will point out a couple of things about this, this passage. One, that everybody did have the same mind. Prosperity gospel tries to get in, across a theology or a doctrine that puts everybody in the same frame of mind. That money is something to, that if you keep giving it to something, it'll give you more and more and more. And that's the same mental mindset about possessions. Uh, if you really look at this passage, you could take this passage and say, yeah, but they just didn't consider anything their own. And because they kept giving it to God, God kept giving them more. Okay, and so that seed of the idea of coming out of, of this passage is that feeds into the prosperity gospel is if you don't have your own mind about it and you have the same mind about it, the same mind that is God's, then you will give up your possessions because God is going to give you more. Um, and as a result, of course, the leaders have power in their ministry and there's no needy person among them is what the passage says. And the idea, I think, uh, many times I've heard prosperity gospel preachers preach this part and they go after the idea, but look at what they look at what happened. There's no needy person among them because they were constantly giving. They were constantly giving to the apostles' ministry. They were constantly giving to the preacher's ministry, and they had no lack themselves. I've heard many prosperity preachers preach that they don't really like the term prosperity gospel, but they just say we're not poverty preachers. I can't find in the you know the gospel and the Bible or anywhere where we're supposed to live in poverty. 
If anything, they would look at this passage and say, but look at what they did. They all had the same mind. They didn't consider things as their own, so they kept giving it to the, to the leadership. And then thus God continued to bless them, and they got more and more and more, and so they never had any lack. He says that's the idea of the prosperity gospel in a nutshell for a lot of people. And so Pentecostals taking this very seriously and taking this passage very seriously justify the doctrine of the prosperity gospel and saying, hey man, if you just have a real giving nature, if the church has a really giving nature, God will continue to give more and more and more to that church. And to them, that is kind of the real test of whether a church is genuine or not, whether or not you know the church demonstrates a generosity. Now, there's a lot of good social reasons for this to be in Pentecostal circles, and I think it grows up out of this. And, of course, it frames the way that they interpret this passage. They, they see power in prayer. They see power in giving for a lot of reasons. Mostly but back in the day when Pentecostalism was first starting out in the early 20th century, Pentecostals were poor. Okay, they were poor people looking for something to give them power over circumstances, and they turned to God. And the Pentecostal message even back then was this can give you power to heal, this can give you power to overcome your circumstances. God loves a generous person, so if you give, you know, God will give back to you. This whole idea, though, is taken to another level. You know, it's put on a, a pedestal and said, listen, you know, this becomes the big central core issue for a lot of Pentecostals in the early days is that God is going to empower people when they need something. And the early church stands as an example of this. Now, a lot of people point to this passage and see that the church practiced what they would call you know, socialism or communism. I don't really see that. Uh, it's more of a volunteer give till it hurts kind of thing which isn't the same as socialism or communism where everybody just throws all their money in a pot. That's not what's happening here. What happens is the wealthier clients in the early church just kind of give to the apostles and the apostles distribute it as people have need. Now, maybe that is a little bit socialist, but it's voluntary socialism. But where Pentecostals today and prosperity preachers take this passage today is more of a look at their generosity and because they were genera generous, God prospered them even more, and thus they didn't have any lack. And so, you know, a lot of people have tried to say, well, why this is what the early church should be. Well, there's different ways to take the early church and do it that way. But this also leads to a little bit of Pentecostal, charismatic, shall we say, I'm better than you. Now, every single denomination of Christianity has given me the song and dance of we're the true Christianity. And Pentecostals are no exception to that. They would argue that if you don't have these kind of powerful actions in your church, that you're a dead church, um, that you just don't have any of the authority or power of God. Pentecostals, because they're kind of a new kid on the block, really don't have a lot of respect for church tradition. And the reason is they think church tradition is nothing more than a way to say your church is dead, you don't have any real power with the Holy Spirit, and so, you know, all you've really done is accepted a false counterfeit. The real deal is when your church is prosperous, when you're moving forward, when your leaders are empowered by the Spirit to do miracles, you know, you have this mentality that says it's the real power that is what is evidence for a church being a true church. They don't give two wits about tradition because of this very idea. So this passage kind of lays the groundwork of what Pentecostals are looking for in an atmosphere of a church. And part of that atmosphere, I think, does lead to the Pentecostal acceptance of the prosperity gospel because it leads to them saying, no, this is, this is a gospel that talks about power over circumstances through the power of God. And they'll ru run right into that. Anything that anything Pentecostals kind of gravitate to tends to be this idea of having power, okay, over circumstances, having power to overcome obstacles in life, that God is there with you and intimately involved in the day-to-day. -day. When somebody gets sick, you pray for them. When somebody needs some money, you just pray about that, or you give to it, or whatever. But it leads people to be prey to charlatans and frauds who claim to have power, and then just give it to them. 
Thou as an atheist, I look at this passage, and I think to the from a literature standpoint, it's interesting that every origin story of anything seems to have this nature or power that's really inherent into the origin of whatever thing it is. Whereas it's always perfect at the beginning or good, and somehow it gets off the rails. And there's always this struggle of getting back on the rails. And the early church in the book of Acts is no exception. You have this idealistic portrayal of the church in Acts chapter 4, where they're facing opposition, they're praying about it, and God gives them power to overcome that opposition. And I think for the early church, this passage would be a reminder of the good old days, of when we had power, the apostles worked with power, and we need to get back to that. And at the time it was written, I think that was kind of the point. You know, you can still have power by believing in this. You know, even though Jesus' apocalyptic prophecies of him coming back within the first generation didn't come true, doesn't mean that the faith isn't true. Maybe God has changed his mind and, you know, we're moving on to something else. There's always an excuse when prophecies don't come to a pass and we're going to kick them down the can, down the road. But the early church would have looked at this and said, this is the ideal of the early church and we need to get back to it. And so you see a lot of over the history of the church, there are have been many socialist, communist type churches and groups that spring up. Still some of them exist to this day. And so it's all based on this idea of sharing everything in common and then having power because of being generous, because of being a people that prays, because of a people that seeks God and asks for God's solutions. So it's easy to see how anyone can actually fall prey to this fall prey to the prosperity gospel when you understand the early church of Acts. Now, these are just my thoughts, and I would be interested in hearing any other thoughts on this passage and Pentecostals and prosperity preachers in general. For me as an atheist, I now see how this can play into a person who is desperate, who wants to see power over their circumstances, who's financially desperate. And a lot of Pentecostals do start out poor, and then they justify the idea of how they became prosperous due to the gospel. Okay, a lot of people, I stopped smoking, I stopped drinking, you know, I did all this stuff. They had this epiphany. Well, yeah, you're saving a lot of money because you're not dropping your money into all this stuff anymore. And now you you have it and you give it to the church, which is kind of another addiction altogether. And the rest of it you keep and you actually use it to build your prosperity, change your life, go get an education, you know, and just dedicate it back to God. It's no accident that certain work ethics, regardless of whether they're religious or otherwise, lead to a better prosperous life. And that's usually what happens with religious conversions, is people stop wasting their money on stuff and start to focus it on what they really want. Some people say, well, this is a good argument for why religion does does some good things. I would argue that you can have an epiphany about this with philosophy or I've known many people who have just stopped being addicted to stuff because they realize it's a dead end. They struggle with it, don't get me wrong, but they get past it, and then they start taking over their life, and religion wasn't required. Uh, Conversion stories that lead to a change of life don't impress me anymore because I've seen people that didn't convert to a religion that do the same thing. So it's not a necessary element. So why do Pentecostals like the prosperity gospel? Because it seems to be what works, okay? It seems to have this thing that keeps moving it forward. But what is that motivation? I mean, I'm sure there's some good psychology behind all this of how this works. And so I'm interested in your comments today. As always, this is just a discussion starter, so free to comment away in the comments. So what do you think about Pentecostals and the prosperity gospel? I'd be interested to hear it. Now, as an atheist, I think it's all garbage and actually is used more to prey on people than anything else. But... I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. So thanks for stopping by. I appreciate your like and share and subscribe. I want to give a shout out to my members, to my citizens and my rabid citizens. Thank you very much. You're the one that motivates me to continue to do these Bible studies and my deconversion talks on Wednesdays as well. So thank you very much to my members. And as always, live your best life. You only get one go around, so give everything you have to uh, your time, your money, your opportunities to yourself and the people you love and care for and to make this a better world. And don't waste them on the trappings of religion and faith. That's a dead end, and you'll be happier if you do. And as always, thanks for stopping by, and I'll catch you next time.